Okay, ladies and gentlemen, today we are continuing with chapter 6, Fundamentals of Convection. We did chapter 4, Transient Heat Conduction. We are skipping chapter 5, which is the numerical methods in heat conduction. The reason for that is you, you're doing a full course in CFD at the moment. And that's the reason why we're not doing that chapter. So we continue, we continue with chapter 6, which is Fundamentals of Convection. And if you look at this chapter, you will see that we are going to look at the physical mechanism of convection, then the classification of fluid flow, which you have done in fluid dynamics, uh, the velocity boundary layer, which you have already done, then the thermal boundary layer, which is going to be something new, paragraph 6.5, laminar and turbulent flow, which you have already done, Paragraph 6.6, .6, heat and momentum transfer in turbulent flow. 6.7, the derivation of the differential convection equations, which we've done already. And the solutions of convection equations, paragraph 6.8. 6.9, non-dimensionalized convection equations and similarity. 6.10, functional forms of friction and convection. And then 6.11, the analogies between momentum and heat transfer. Could I just ask the gentleman there at the back, uh, could you just close the door for me please? And if you can just make sure that the door stay closed. Thank you very much. Okay, so you'll see it is quite a long chapter, but a lot of the work you've already done. So we are not going to spend two or three weeks on this chapter. Uh, I hope we're just going to spend three lectures on it. So it's going to be very quick that we will finish this chapter. Okay, so let's start with paragraph 6.1, the physical mechanism of convection, a sort of an explanation what convection heat transfer is, and we are going to do it with examples. That is going to be the easiest. Okay, the first case that we are going to look at is a flat plate, and this flat plate is heated to a temperature of 50 degrees Celsius. Okay. Oh, before the flat plate, we've got a fan. Okay. And air at the temperature of 20 degrees Celsius and 5 meters per second, which is forced over the flat plate. Okay. So we will have heat transfer, Q dot 1, from the flat plate to the air. And this type of heat transfer we call forced convection heat transfer. Forced convection heat transfer, HT, heat transfer. Forced convection heat transfer. So that is the first type of heat transfer that we're going to study in this course. The second one is one where the plate is at 50 degrees Celsius okay, and we've got air at 20 degrees Celsius. But the air is not being forced over the flat plate. Okay. But what is going to happen is that the air that is going to make contact with the flat plate is going to be heated its density decreases and because of the buoyancy forces it is going to move up like that okay. so at very very low velocities there is going to be movement over the flat plate but we do not force it with a fan or with a pump and this type of convection heat transfer is called natural convection heat transfer. Natural convection heat transfer. Okay, and the third type is again, let's consider this flat plate, again at a temperature of 50 degrees Celsius with air at 20 degrees Celsius air at 20 degrees Celsius but now gravity 
is equal to zero. There's no gravity force field working on it. Okay, so in this case we would have said it is Q dot two for natural convection heat transfer. In this case there will also be heat transfer Q dot three, but now it is conduction heat transfer. conduction heat transfer. The heat is only being transferred through conduction through molecules which bumps against each other. That is the mechanism of the heat transfer, conduction heat transfer. Okay. So if we look at that, re at that region there and we look at the molecule on the on the flat plate, if that molecule would look at the molecule next to it, then it is going to be there for a small delta T and then it's going to be gone. It's going to be transferred away. Okay. Then the same here, if we look at that molecule and that molecule, then that molecule is going to stay a little bit longer, but it is also going to be convected away. In this case, if we look at the molecules, the molecules is going to be in a certain pattern. If that is molecule one, and that's molecule two and three, then in general they're going to stay there. The energy is going to be transferred by the bumping action, the collisions of the molecules next to, against each other. Okay, so the three different types of convection heat transfer with conduction which can be seen as a special case of one of the cases of convection heat transfer. Okay. Now, in general, in general, let's call it the higher <coughs> the fluid motion The higher the fluid motion, if we look at the three different cases, the higher the heat transfer will be. So the higher the fluid motion, the higher the heat transfer rate will be. And from experience and experiments, from experience and lots of experiments, it has been found that the convection heat transfer that the convection heat transfer is a function of quite a lot of things. It's a function of the viscosity of the fluid which is being considered, the thermal conductivity of the fluid the density of the fluid and the CP of the fluid. Okay, so all the characteristics that describe the fluid will influence the convection heat transfer rate from the plate. It is also a function of the velocity. Okay, the velocity, the higher the velocity, the higher the convection heat transfer rate would be. It's also a function of Ts, the temperature of the surface of the plate. Okay. So that is Ts, that is the temperature of the surface of the plate, and it is a function of T infinite, the temperature far away from the plate. So that would typically be T infinite. It is also a function of the area of the plate, how many square meters it is. It is also a function of the length of the plate, the length of the plate, and the geometry of the plate. If we take this plate and we bend it in a convex or a concave form, it will influence the heat transfer rate and the heat transfer rate would be different. 
or if I take this plate and I bend it so that it looks like a sphere, the heat transfer rate is going to be influenced by the geometry of the plate and the surface roughness. If it's very, very smooth and polished, the heat transfer would be much different than that when it would be very rough. So all these things influences the heat transfer rate. And the type of, let's call it, the flow regime. The types of flow regime can be laminar flow, transition flow, or turbulent flow. Or turbulent flow. Okay. So all those things influences convection heat transfer. So when people started studying convection heat transfer, they did some experiments and they did the experiments for a certain type of fluid okay, at a certain velocity, at a certain wall temperature, T infinite area, length and all these things and then they could, could, could get the convection heat transfer value. Okay. Now let's suppose they did it for water at 20 degrees Celsius if they then did it for water at 50 degrees Celsius, the convection heat transfer rate would be different. So it means a large, large database had to be developed. And they were developing that to describe convection heat transfer with. There wasn't an elegant way of putting everything together. And we're going to see how they did that at the end. Okay, so Newton's cooling law. They knew about Newton's cooling law. Newton's cooling law. And Newton's cooling law says the convection fl flux, small q dot, of convection, which is equal to the heat transfer rate divided by the surface area, is equal to the heat transfer coefficient multiplied by Ts minus T infinite. And the units would be watts per square meter, and we're going to call this equation one because we're going to use it later on. Okay. So after people did lots of experiments, they actually realized that if they have the heat transfer coefficient, then they can solve the problem. But the heat transfer coefficient is dependent on all this stuff. Okay. So it's dependent on the viscosity, the thermal conductivity, the density and the CP, which means it is the fluid properties at a certain temperature. It is being influenced by the velocity, the temperatures of the wall and the stream, the area, the length of the plate, the geometry, the roughness, and if the flow is laminar in the transitional flow regime or in the turbulent flow regime. Okay. So it means that if you develop a table, then you need the heat transfer coefficients as a function of the rest of the values. Okay. Now convection heat transfer or the convection heat transfer coefficient actually the sort of definition of it, which, which we do not really use, but if you look at it carefully, you would, see, you would see it is equivalent to the rate of heat transfer. Okay. It's the rate equivalent to the rate of heat transfer between a solid surface In a solid surface and a fluid, it is the rate of heat transfer between a solid surface and a fluid per unit surface area 
per unit temperature difference. Per unit temperature difference. The convection heat transfer, which is the rate of heat transfer between is the rate of heat transfer between a solid surface and a fluid per unit surface area and per unit temperature difference. That is the definition of the heat transfer coefficient. Okay. Now if we go back to fluid mechanics, you will remember that fluid flow is often confined by solid surfaces so that we have something like this. We have usually a boundary layer. So if we would plot next to the solid surface the velocity distribution and that is equal to the free stream velocity V and that is equal to 0.99 V then that is the boundary layer thickness the boundary layer thickness or delta boundary layer thickness delta and this boundary layer is caused by viscosity viscosity forces so the viscosity forces are prominent and much larger than the inertial forces. That is what it means, the boundary layer. And at this point here, we've got a zero slip. We know from experiments that the velocity, for all practical purposes, equal to zero. I'm sure it is not 100% zero, but for all practical purposes, the velocity of the air molecule next to the surface is equal to zero. And this zero slip is obviously relative to the plate. If this plate is moving at a velocity of 10 meters per second, then it means that the velocity there would be equal to 10. Okay, so it's a relative to the plate. Okay, now what is the implication of the no slip boundary condition? So the implication of the no slip boundary condition the implication is that the heat transfer from the hot surface to the fluid next to it is by conduction only the first layer heat transfer is by conduction that is the implication of it if this fluid particles are standing still then We've got this case where the heat transfer is purely by conduction next to the wall. Okay. And the result of that would be that the convection heat transfer rate is equal to the conduction heat transfer rate and the conduction would be equal to minus K take note of the fluid the thermal conductivity of the fluid multiplied by partial dTdy where y is equal to zero and that is equation two now equation one gives us the convection heat transfer the convection heat transfer is equal to that the convection heat transfer that is conduction so we can say if we equate these two equations that the heat transfer coefficient the heat transfer coefficient multiplied by Ts minus T infinite is equal to minus K of the fluid multiplied by partial dT dy where y is equal to zero. And from this we can solve the heat transfer coefficient as minus the thermal conductivity of the fluid multiplied by partial dT dy where y is equal to zero of T s minus T infinite and the units for the heat transfer coefficient is watts per square meter Kelvin or you can also write it as watts per square meter degree Celsius it doesn't matter
Okay, so if we now look at a surface, if we look at the surface, let's say that is x, that is y, and we've got convection on the surface. And although I'm drawing this surface as a flat plate, it doesn't necessarily have to be a flat plate. It can be an aircraft wing or anything like that. Okay. With heat transfer. And the heat transfer can be any one of those three modes. If we would now go and use this definition to measure the heat transfer coefficient, what do we need? We need the temperatures. We need the temperature of the surface, we need the temperature of the free stream, we need the thermal conductivity of the fluid, and we need the temperature gradients next to the wall. Then we can get the heat transfer coefficient. So if we would go and get the heat transfer coefficient at point one, okay, and at point two, point three, etc. We would get, go and get all the heat transfer coefficients. Then, if we plot them, the heat transfer coefficient as a function of x, then normally they are not constant. So they would look something like that. That would be at point 1, that would be at point 2, that would be at point 3, and that would be at point n. So the heat transfer coefficient on the surface is normally not constant. It changes as a function of x. So if we have the heat transfer coefficients as a function of x, what are we going to do as practical engineers? As practical engineers, we would say that, yes, although the heat transfer coefficient is a function of x, for all practical purpose, purposes, we are interested in the average heat transfer coefficient and if we have the average heat transfer coefficient, then we can do our calculations. <coughs> Nusselt number. Okay, the Nusselt number. The Nusselt number is named after Nussel which did great work in convection heat transfer and by definition the Nusselt number is equal to the heat transfer coefficient multiplied by the characteristic length divided by the thermal conductivity. And take note, it is the thermal conductivity of the fluid that we're talking of, not of the wall, okay, of the fluid. Okay. So H is the heat transfer coefficient L is a characteristic length and K is the thermal conductivity of the fluid. If we go back to the Reynolds number, the Reynolds number is equal to rho V multiplied by the characteristic length divided by the viscosity. We had something very similar. Okay. Now something that is very, very important and which you haven't used a lot is that this characteristic length, this characteristic length is very important because you've done many problems where, for example, you've determined when is the flow laminar and when is it turbulent. Okay. Can you remember? When is the flow, flow laminar and when is it turbulent? At the Reynolds number of 2100, okay, 2300. You all agree? Something like that? You're all wrong. Okay. You're all wrong. Not completely, but in principle you are. Okay. In principle, you are. Because, Samantha, the Reynolds number for a tube, okay, the Reynolds number for a tube is based on the diameter. So there, we use the diameter 
and for flow through a tube, yes, if it is based on the diameter, then the flow changes from laminar flow to turbulent flow when the Reynolds number is approximately 2,100 or 2,300. But that is not the same for your car. Okay. So for your car, that is your car, the flow doesn't change from laminar to turbulent at the Reynolds number of 2,300. That's not a general rule. Okay. For your car, experiments need to be done and then somebody who does the experiments is going to decide I want to use maybe the length of the car in my calculation for the characteristic value. But then also the Reynolds number where it changes from laminar to turbulent is going to be another value. It is not going to be 2300. Okay. So there it is 2300. Okay. Here it is not 2300. It's another value. Okay. You're going to see for a flat plate something like a hundred thousand for example so that's not a general rule now why is this important this is important because the Nusselt number is the same the Nusselt number when we do experiments for a tube then yes the characteristic length that we're going to use is going to be the diameter and then usually we would actually put a D there like there to indicate it is based on the diameter but if we do it for a flat plate, then it is not going to be based on the diameter, it's going to be based on another dimension. So the Nusselt number, the fact that it is based on the dimension is very, very important. Okay, so it's not a general thing being used everywhere. Okay. So let's look at the following case. We've got a flat plate at a temperature T2, another flat plate at a temperature T1, and here we've got fluid layers, so flow flowing through it. And the distance between the two plates is L, and the heat transfer rate is going to be from T2 to T1, because we select T2 to be higher than that of T1. So that is the decision that we've made. And we say that delta T is equal to T2 minus T1. Okay. Now if the fluid is in motion, if the fluid is in motion, okay, then we can say that the conduction heat transfer, or sorry, the convection heat transfer, is equal to the heat transfer coefficient multiplied by delta T. The heat transfer flux by convection is equal to the heat transfer coefficient multiplied by T2 minus T1, which is equal to delta T. If the fluid is stationary, if the fluid is stationary, then the heat transfer is by conduction, and then it is equal to K multiplied by delta T divided by L. If we take the ratios of the two, of the convection heat transfer rate but the side divided by the conduction heat transfer rate. The convection this, the, the convection heat transfer rate divided by the conduction heat transfer rate, then it is equal to the heat transfer coefficient multiplied by delta T divided by the conduction which is K multiplied by delta T divided by L. Okay, do the calculation for me.
so that is equal to the heat transfer coefficient multiplied by L divided by K, which is equal to the Nusselt number. So, what, I'm, what am I trying to show? I'm trying to show that the Nusselt number represents, firstly, the Nusselt number represents the enhancement the enhancement of heat transfer as a result of fluid motion as a result of fluid motion the Nusselt number represents the enhancement of heat transfer as a result of fluid motion the Nusselt number is the ratio of the convection heat transfer divided by the conduction heat transfer. Okay, then if the Nusselt number is equal to 1, what does that mean? If the Nusselt number is equal to 1, then heat transfer is by pu pure conduction. It's by pure conduction. And then lastly, if the Nusselt number is smaller than one, If the Nusselt number is smaller than 1, then what then? If the Nusselt number is smaller than 1 then? Then? It is? It doesn't conduct electricity. It doesn't conduct electricity? No. It means that I'm going to give you I'm going to give you zero for the test two and for test one and for the exam. Okay. Because then you're making a fundamental error. So the Nusselt number cannot be less than one. Okay, so if you do make a, if you calculate the Nusselt number in the test or exam or something like that and it's less than one then you must know it can't be you've made a calculation error <coughs> can only be less than one if there's something in between that eats up it, all the energy isn't it okay. okay in terms of forced convection what are typical examples that you can think of of forced convection that most of us experience every day okay examples are on a hot summer's day when you put on a fan okay the fan would transfer the heat away from your body that is convection heat transfer that is a practical example the other example is the air conditioning in this venue okay air at a lower temperature than you are being blown in at a very low velocity otherwise it is too noisy but it is coming in and we've got natural convection around you okay, up there it's forced convection when it comes out when it goes into the system again then it is again forced <coughs> convection okay then when you drink coffee when you stir it then already you're doing forced convection if you blow it a little bit forced convection heat transfer in winter if it's a very if it's a cold day and the wind blows then it feels even colder it's another example of forced convection heat transfer and then the fan in the data projector the fan in your laptop in your computer or other examples <coughs> of forced convection heat transfer okay so let's start with paragraph 6.2, the classification of fluid flow. And I'm not going to do it in detail, 
because you've already done it and you should, have, you should know it. But it is important that you go and read through it and work through it very well. Okay. Because we are going to use it. 6.2 is the classification of fluid flow. Okay. And it starts by describing viscous flow, viscous and inviscid flow. Viscous flow and inviscous flow is all about the viscosity. It's all about the viscosity. Okay. In the boundary layer example that we've considered, in the boundary layer the viscous forces are very prominent and much larger than that of the other forces. So in that region the flow is viscous. Outside the boundary layer there are no viscous forces. You can say the flow is irritational. So therefore, in that region, the flow is inviscid. So that's the first one. Then internal and external. Internal flow and external flow. Internal flow is flow through a pipe, through a channel. External flow is, you've got a hot plate, you blow over it, the flow going over the geometry externally. That's very easy. Then, compressible and incompressible flow. Compressible and incompressible flow, that is all about the density. It is about, is the density constant or not? If we say that the density is constant, then we can say it is incompressible flow. If the density changes, then the flow is compressible. Another criteria that we use to determine if the flow is compressible or not is the Mach number. If the Mach number is smaller than 0.3, then we can say the flow is incompressible. If it's larger than 0.3, the flow is compressible. Then, laminar. And turbulent flow, we've discussed it now a little bit, and we know the Reynolds number is being used as a good criteria to tell us if the flow is laminar or turbulent. However, we have to be careful, the 2300 value is just valid, valid for tubes, not for all objects and all geometries. Okay, so it's the Reynolds number, and the Reynolds number is the ratio of the inertial forces to the viscous forces. That is the Reynolds number. Then, natural, and another word for natural is unforced. Natural versus forced flow. A forced flow, usually in mechanical engineering, is where we make use of fans or pumps, or a difference in height. Then we've got forced flow. Natural flow is where we just leave it. Okay, the temperature differences will cause the flow to flow by itself. It occurs naturally. Okay, then steady versus unsteady. Steady versus unsteady. And that is where we, make, where we see how things change as a function of time. If things change as a function of time, then it is unsteady. If the flow changes as a function of time, sorry, if it, it doesn't change as a function of time, then it is steady. If it changes as a function of time, it is unsteady. Okay. Now, if we look at the continuity equation, d rho dt plus ddx of rho u plus ddy of rho v plus ddz of rho w is equal to zero, then I have found that many of you have problems with the density. If you've got a problem, 
and the density doesn't change as a function of time, then you say it is a constant, and therefore all these terms are also a constant. Okay. Do many of you have that problem? Okay. Let me give you a few examples to make it clear. Okay. Let's consider a turbine on the wing of an Airbus. Okay. Now the turbine, if I can just draw it schematically, is going to have firstly a compressor, there's going to be a combustion chamber and there's going to be a turbine section. Okay. You're going to do it next semester. Okay. And if we look at an air, the air, okay, now the air bus is cruising, okay, at a constant height of 10,000 meters at a Mach number of, there it is on the wing, okay and it is flying at the Mach number of, let's say, equal to 0.2. Okay, Mach number of 0.2. Okay. Now, if we look at the air particle go going through the turbine, then the following is going to occur. Okay, when it enters the, the turbine, it actually has some blades standing still. They do not move. And the function of those blades is to direct the flow so that the blades, which are running at a high speed, can, let's call it, receive the flow at the right angle. Okay. So that is just to direct it. And here are the turbine blades like that. And they are rotating at a very, very high speed. Okay. Okay. Now once the air is through that, then it goes through again some blades which are standing still and again the blades just redirect the flow for the next turbine row and so it goes on quite a few of them okay so it is being directed then it goes through the compressor blades and the compressor blade is going to start compressing the air okay. then it directs them again for the next set of blades then it compresses it again then it goes into the combustion chamber when we add the fuel, okay, the temperature increases and then it is being expanded. Again, when it is being expanded, we just don't want to give it to the turbine blades. There are some blades which changes the direction so that the turbine blades can get it at the right direction. Okay. And it goes through a few of these cycles until it goes out. So let's consider you sitting on one of these air particles. Okay. There you're sitting on it. What is your experience going to be? Your experience is going to be the following. <coughs> okay. If we plot the density, take note as a function of x, as the path as it goes through. Okay. Okay, you sitting on this density on this particle, if you would measure the density, it would be a constant. Okay. It wouldn't be 1 because it is at 10,000 meters, so it is going to be a density of 0.1 or 0.2 kilograms per cubic meter, something like that. Okay. Now things are going to change dramatically. Okay. The density is going to increase because that is the function of the compressor, is to compress everything, okay. to increase the pressure. It's not going to be a path like that, it's going to be a cyclic path. But in general, that is going to happen. Then in the combustion chamber, I cannot remember if the pressure stays constant or not, but it's, let's, let's show an increase in density because of the combustion process. And then it is going to be expanded. Okay. Something like that. And at the end, it's going to end up at the same density value than in the beginning. Okay, so let's call that point 0.2. That is maybe measuring point 0.1, measuring point 0.3 and 4, and measuring point 0.5. Okay. If we plot the density now, 
as a function take note of x not of time of x okay. then the density if we measure the density there point one is going to be a constant okay. if we measure the density at point five it's also going to be a constant if we measure the density at that point there it's going to stay the same if we measure, keep on measuring the density there it's going to be higher than there but it's going to be a constant then the same with point 3 and point 4 something like that okay so that is if you measure the density at a point okay. if you would actually now get onto the density particle as I've mentioned okay okay sorry we've done that already if you get onto the density particle you're going to get that So what do you see here? It depends how you measure. You see? In the first case, I got onto the particle and I moved through the coordinate system. In the next case, I put my measuring point there and I measure it. Okay. If I get onto the particle, I get onto the particle. Uh, if I look at the density as a function of time then something like that is going to happen isn't it the density as a function of time so if we consider now this problem of d rho dt plus uh, ddx of rho u plus ddy of rho v plus ddz of rho w is equal to zero if we consider the flow field in terms of my x and y axis there's y and there's x, there's x and in it we've got our turbine okay. Okay. if we now look at this as our reference system okay this is the picture that we are looking at like a camera We're looking at only that what happens to that term d rho dt d rho dt if I would measure the density there at that point it's going to be a certain value and it is not going to change it's going to be a constant you agree if I change if I measure it at point 4 it is also not going to change so therefore this term is going to be zero the densities doesn't change as a function of time but the density is a function of X isn't it so it depends on the value of x and y in this grid what the value of the density is going to be and it's going to vary throughout the flow field so therefore it doesn't mean that if this one is constant that all the values are constant you understand? okay things are totally different if the aeroplane comes to land comes closer to the runway it lands and it stops then this density this density if you measure it there is going to change as a function of time then it is going to be an unsteady process okay you follow okay ladies and gentlemen thank you very much that's the end of the lecture